This is a workshop for brand new head coaches to get you to uh, be familiar with the uh, Macomb Science Olympiad website for, uh, for our elementary division. Um, my name is Ruth Cummins and I've been involved in Science Olympiad for like 37 years as a head coach and also as part of the uh, uh, tournament planning committee. Um, there are, uh, basically today we're going to be going through the uh, Elementary Science Olympiad website and let me share with you a couple of uh, uh, things that you probably want to jot down or take a screenshot of. The www.macomso.org is the website that is going to give you all of the possible answers you need. Uh, and we'll be going through all of that. And then there's also my email address there. I am the mentor for new head coaches. So if you have any questions that you can't get answered off of the website, feel free to contact me. And uh, if I can't get you an answer, I'll connect you with somebody who can get you an answer. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to use my uh, my services as a mentor for uh, for any new head coaches. All right, so I'm going to start with the MacombSO.org website. Um, this is the uh, website that you'll probably want to bookmark. It's going to be uh, 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 it, it's going to be your best buddy because it's going to have all the answers there. And by going over this website, we're going to be figuring out how to. Uh, select your team and how to organize your team. Today we'll be talking about scheduling and getting your coaches and your students trained for their events. We'll be talking about the important dates that you need to know. Also, we'll talk more about the competition itself, both the district competitions and the, um, uh, the Macomb County competition. We'll be talking about your responsibilities as the head coach, and we'll be talking about money that you'll need a little bit of money for some of the activities that are uh, you'll be involved in, and talking about where where different coaches get the money that they need and what you need to spend your money on. So on the MacombSO.org website, we are going to hover over the elementary button, which is the button you're going to be using a lot. And as you can see, we'll be talking about the events, which I'm not going to click on quite yet. There's also a section for kits and supplies that you can uh, uh, purchase or get. We'll be talking about the tournaments, the Macomb tournament, and then there are also four district tournaments that we'll be talking about. And there's a section for past scores. We'll talk about that too. But we're going to start by clicking on head coach. Now, this page has lots and lots of information for the, um, for the head coach. So uh, let's talk, well, let's look a little bit at the setup of the page. You'll see here there is a head coach tips page and you'll get a new tips page every month. So let's just take a look at the October tips page. And you can see that we've broken it down into what do you need to think about this month? Because it can get really overwhelming thinking about everything you have to get done before May. So we break it down month by month and uh, and it just helps you to kind of see what is it that you are should be most uh, thinking about right now. It also gives you important dates that you need to be aware of and mark it on your calendar and be ready. So again, the tips page just helps you uh, figure out what's important right now for you to be working on. Um, let me get back 
to the head coach page. There's also a calendar over here on the left hand side, and that will help you see what's coming up so you can make sure you have it in your calendar. At this point right now, the uh, the next thing that head coaches need to worry about is uh, next Monday, there is a head coach information meeting uh, that would be on October 24th, next Monday, that uh, you might want to consider attending. Um, now, in more in the center of the page, these are all tools that will help you. Um, starting an elementary science Olympiad team. This first page here kind of gives you an overview of the year and what you can expect to be happening during each month so that there's no surprises. And these have all the current dates on here for you know the different tournaments and the different things that are going to be happening. So that's just a whole year overview. It also tells you what is required in order for you to have a team to participate. And this kind of goes over, you know, some of the money that you'll need. The registration is $100. You're probably going to want to get some t-shirts for your team. And that is somewhere around $300. And possibly you're going to need to buy some supplies, which it's an average of maybe another $300. Um, and we'll talk more about where you can get that money uh, in just a few minutes. And the page that actually, this is my favorite page. This helps to explain the different roles. A lot of people get head coach and event coach mixed up. The head coach is you. You are the person in charge of the whole team. And as part of the team, besides the students that are on your team, there's also event coaches. Now, we have 17 events this year. It'd be real nice if you had 17 event coaches. That doesn't always happen, but uh, however many event coaches you have, the co event coaches are in charge of understanding their event and getting that information across to the students. So they are the ones working directly with the students. Now, as a head coach, you might also be an event coach. A lot of times head coaches take on an event and help to coach that event too. So, uh, and as you have time, you may wanna take a look at uh, some of the other information on this page, like you know how many students you can expect, uh, how many events each student will be in, what grades are, uh, applicable. So uh, this page has a lot of information for you there. And then the last page in this section just shows the events for this coming year. Um, and we'll get more into detail about the different events as time goes on as we go through this workshop. Um, we also have membership rules, which I'm not going to spend much time here. Uh, but you know, you may want to take a look at that and, and it'll give ideas of what to do about second teams and things like that. There's the head coach handbook, which is it's like I think like 47 pages long. It's it's quite long. Um, so you know it, there's a lot of extra information in there, but uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, pretty much all the information is on the website somewhere. And uh, there's also flyers that you might use when you're trying to get your, um, your team, trying to get people interested in being on the Science Olympiad team, as you're trying to explain how, what is Science Olympiad and try to get kids and coaches, this might be a... Uh, a, a good flyer that uh, that will help you to explain what Science Olympiad is all about. Now, I'm also there's also a video that 
I used a lot when I was coaching. And uh, let me show you where that video is. Uh, it is, let me make sure I have it right. It is under events, so under elementary and under events. And I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. And you can see there's a 2016 Elementary Science Olympiad video. And that goes through all the different videos or all the different events. Now, granted, these are events back from 2016. So, uh, you know, there may be some differences between the events we have this year and the events we had that back in 2016. But it at least gets the idea across to the kids and the parents what Science Olympiad is all about, what do the events look like, how do the kids compete, you know, it shows how exciting it is. So it's just a really good video to help to get your kids and the parents interested in being on the Science Olympiad team. Okay. Um, and feel free, by the way, to ask questions as we're going along. Um, let's see, we already did all this. All right, let's go back to the head coach page. And as you're trying to get your students at your school interested. There's also, there's a, a tri-fold flyer that you can hand out. Uh, there's a, we have open house kits that, let me click on this here. We have open house kits that you can reserve and you get, I believe it's a couple of these big tubs like you see on the page and it's filled with um, the 16 or 17 events and they're all on report boards and you can put them up in the room wherever you're holding a uh, a meeting or you know getting the kids to be interested in science olympiad and it shows the different events and and some of the things that they would have to do um if you contact kathy deckert and the her contact information is right there and you let them know, you know, you're planning on having an open house to try to generate interest in your school and you'd like to borrow the open house kit. Uh, that's exactly what it's for, to help you generate interest in your, uh, on your team. Wonderful. Would you um, recommend uh, getting these sooner than later? Like are other people grabbing them too as well or? I mean yeah, it is true. The um, the the kits get used a lot between now and you know january gotcha okay. so yeah so if you can okay. figure out when you want to have your initial meeting to try to generate interest uh and well and and kathy deckert may have you know she'll be able to tell you what days are are it's available to get an open house kit so maybe you can okay. plan your meeting around when you can get the open house kits too. Wonderful, yes, I will reach out to her. Thank you, yeah, per perfect. Um, let me get back to the head coach page here. Now, so at this point now, you've got a bunch of kids interested in Science Olympiad. And now your next point will be to choose and organize your team. Um, the team this year, we're allowing 17 students. You may see on other, maybe older papers and stuff, it may talk about 16 students, but we have upped it to 17 students now because we do have an extra event, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. So for the year, for this school year, the 2023 tournament, we're looking at 17 students. You're also allowed to have a second team. If you have more than 17 students that wanna be on your team, 
you can have a second team. So you'd have your, you know, your first draft team and your second draft team. Um, so, and, and the beauty of that is, you know, you don't have to turn any student down. Anyone who's interested can be on a team. Um, a lot of times, uh, coaches, head coaches will use the second team as, uh, you know, maybe for their younger students so that, you know, give them a little extra practice. So next year they can be on the first team. Um, the one thing you do have to think about, though, is it is extra work to have to have more than 17 kids. Like when I was teaching and I had my team meetings in the room, I'd have the, you know my 16 kids plus one parent for each kid that filled up my classroom. And and so, you know, if I had a second team, I'd have to hold the meeting someplace else because my classroom just wasn't big enough to do that. So that's all something to think about. Now, as you are um, selecting your team, you may end up having some students that are returning. They were on the team last year or they were on a team maybe at a different school. So they're familiar with Science Olympiad. So that familiarity is definitely a plus that would that would be um, helpful but um well let me so what you you're looking for students to be on your team that first of all enjoy science i mean i can't imagine that they're going to want to be on the science olympia team if they don't enjoy science but you want students who are responsible, that will you know, do what needs to be done, that will show up to their meetings, that work well with a team. Um, sometimes I would ask uh, the teachers, you know, how are they, how do they function in the classroom? Um, there were years when i ran a science club an after school science club and um first of all i'd look to see well who signs up for this because if you're interested enough in science club you'd probably be interested in science olympiad too but as we're doing the activities you know who shows an interest in what we're doing uh enthusiasm and the ability um And you know, we take a look at their uh, the teacher comments on you know their grades. Something you do have to be careful of though is every once in a while I would get a where a teacher would say, oh, it would be good for the student to be on the science Olympiad team, and you have to be careful what that means because sometimes that might mean you know the student struggles and it would be good for their self esteem, but You've got to do what's good for your whole team. An example of that is it was one year, this was many years ago, but I had a student who I wanted him to be on the team because he struggled. He had, you know, he had some issues, but I thought it would be good for him to be on the team. I was the one who said that. And then it ended up, he ended up, getting he had trouble working with other kids and and he was in uh reflection relay that was the the event that i was judging and he got upset and he took the mirror and he smashed it on the ground and i had to disqualify my own team <laughs> because because you know he they couldn't finish so so, you know, you do have to be careful of, and make sure that you're not putting kids on the team because, you know, you're trying to, you know, boost their their self-confidence when they're not exactly a fit for the team. So just, just be careful of that. Thank you. All right. Let me go back to the page here. So when you decide on who you want to invite on your team and if you want to have a second team, 
Uh, we do have some, some forms here that you can take a look at, like announcing the team. If you take a look at that, these are just, these are just, um, this is something that I would send out, you know, the name of all the kids who made the team, telling them, okay, we're going to have our first team meeting on such and such a day. Where is it going to be? What do you need to know about it? Obviously, you can't just copy this information because it's going to have all the wrong dates and everything, but it gives you the, the types of information you need to get out to uh, the kids that are going to hopefully be on your team. Now, if you choose to have a secondary team, then uh, you won't have to have this next part. This, uh, this next part here just shows, um, these are what I call my sorry letters. I'm sorry you didn't make the team this year, but hopefully you'll try again next year. So I just shared these so that you would have at least a head start at the words uh, and the information that you might want to include in such a letter. Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you. Then, now that you have your team identified, uh, you'll have your initial meeting with the actual kids and their parents at some point because you've got to get some information out to them. Um, and at that initial meeting, there is a video that's good to show. Well, and I think I've, I've already talked about the one video. I'm going to go back to events. But this is where the video is that I talked about a few minutes ago. But up here, there's also a couple of videos that will explain to the parents that you know, hopefully you're going to coach an event and this is what you can expect if you are going to be an event coach. And there's two different videos that will help you to, uh, uh, to help your event coaches. Now, at, at my initial meeting, I would always run this video here, which as I said earlier, goes over how a Science Olympiad tournament, what it looks like and what the kids need to do. So this, this is a, a real good video to help out with that. There are other videos that are available. Uh, I think at the point of this video that I'm taping right now, it's, these videos are not on the website yet because we just re renewed the website and we just change some things around. And I think there's still some things that are not on the website at this point, but there are videos and I'll show you where they are, like from a kid's perspective, what uh, a, a fifth grader, what they thought about being on the Science Olympiad team, which might be a good video to show when you've got your, uh, your kids and your parents there. There's also videos from former Science Olympiad students and uh, you know, like there's one that's uh, from a student who now works at NASA and how Science Olympiad got him started on Science Olympiad and, and enjoying science. So there's a lot of videos out there that can help with that. And where you would find those now for now is on, um, on YouTube. There is, uh, my husband had recorded, he spent many, many, many years recording different things for Science Olympiad, and he has them here. His title, oddly enough, is Husband of Nerd Queen. That was him. So if you go to Husband of Nerd Queen slash Science Olympiad, you're going to see a lot of Science Olympiad videos that he produced. And... You know, here's one of, I think this is a middle school student that talked about Science Olympiad. Um, 
here's oh here's a, a doctor who talked about how science olympia got him going so here's the aerospace engineer so you know it just shows how you know science olympia goes above and beyond what the kids get in their classroom and uh, it really helps to spark that a lot of enthusiasm for science and that and that goes on for a long long time in the kids and in fact as they are adults so it's a good program so all right so you now have your students and the kids and their and their parents let me go back to where i was with on the head coach page and when you are talking with the kids and even showing that video that has all the different events there are some forms here that you might find helpful where you're connecting the students to the team. Let me get that up here. So this is a letter of commitment to the team that I always used with my kids. Uh, and it spells out exactly what the kids can expect to happen over the next few months, how much work it's going to be, how many times you're gonna meet each week, um, you know, how much time, uh, making sure they understand you have to be available on that Science Olympiad day for the practice tournament and the main tournament. Now, keep in mind, these dates are not correct because this is from a few years ago. So the purpose of this is just to help you see what is important to get across to the kids right now. So I always choose the letter of commitment to the team. And the reason for this is I had a student many, many years ago where he was very good at what he did. He was so smart and he was doing really, really well. But it's fairly easy to be uh, uh, working on your Science Olympiad events while it's winter time and it's cold and you don't want to be outside anyway. But eventually before your May tournament, the weather's gonna to start to get nice. And you're not gonna to wanna to stay after school to work on you know, your Science Olympiad event. And I had a student who about a week before the tournament, he quit because he wanted to go out for recess. And ever since that year, I always have this letter of commitment to the team and I make sure they understand you are committing to the team even when the weather is nice. So you need to, you know, the whole team is depending on everybody on the team doing their part. So that's the reason I have that commitment to the team. I also have a letter that I give to the parents, making sure the parents understand these are the dates you need to mark on your calendar. This is what I need from you. Uh, what t-shirt size does your child need? Uh, many, many times I would forget to ask that. And here I am at the last minute scrambling, trying to get t-shirt sizes. So here I am the, now, the first meeting I have with the parents and I'm getting t-shirt sizes. So I don't have to be looking these up later. So this, this just shows you all the information you probably want to put in your letter to the parents. I give them all the dates that they need to know so put them in your calendar. So don't be telling me that you now have a baseball game on tournament day because if you are committing to the team, you are committing to that day too. And then uh, they'll eventually, I'll have a, uh, a roster to give to the teams of all the kids and all their contact information because they're all gonna need to be talking to each other uh, during the course of Science Olympiad. So those are just some ideas of what you need to include when you are connecting the students to the team. And um, you also, at the same time that you are connecting your students to the team, you are also trying to recruit, recruit event coaches. Now, Many schools, 
start, uh, they tell the parents, if you want your child to be on the team, you have to coach. So uh, that way, if you've got 17 kids on your team, you'll have 17 coaches. You've got that uh, taken care of right then and there. So as you are talking with your kids and explaining all the different events, the parents can be writing, uh, jotting down which events they might be interested in coaching. Now, I never required a parent to coach because sometimes you will get parents coaching that just don't have their heart in coaching and they don't necessarily do a first class job of coaching. So, um, you know, you are guaranteed to get enough coaches at that point, but will they be the quality of coaches that you want? So what there are other places for you to get coaches and I'm going to go down to the FAQ section down here. And uh, there is one. Oh, where can I get coaches to work on students? So, you know, it does talk about parents are obviously your first option. But you can also get grandparents. I've had grandparents coaching my kids. I've had older siblings coaching my students. Um, I have had like middle school students, older brothers or sisters come back and coach. But I always make sure I'm there. I would have them coach in my classroom after school and I would always be there um, just because it's a little harder for a middle school kid to deal with, you know, behavior or, you know, if they're absent or something like that. So, you know, they knew the content of and what they needed to teach the kids, but, um, they, um, you know, I just felt better if I was there with the kids if they're in middle school. I didn't have middle school kids that often, but I did at times. Um, high school students, especially the NHS students at your high school, uh, they are usually looking for community service opportunities. Um, other teachers in the school, uh, student teachers, they're looking to put something on the resume that they were involved in Science Olympiad. So, um, you know, that's a good resource too. We've also had schools that uh, the, the school principal would coach an event or, you know, other people that work in the school. Uh, and I've also had some community experts. I've had uh, uh, a nurse Actually, she was a doctor. She was a nurse practitioner. She came and she helped with anatomies. Uh, I had uh, uh, somebody in the neighborhood who was really interested in weather, and he came and he coached an event for us. So, and you know, they had no ties to the kids on the team. They just wanted to coach because they were interested in the topic. So, there's lots of other places to look for um, for people to help you coach. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, no, no, no. I was just going to uh, uh, ask you about, um, you know, the ages of the kids, but you were mentioning like middle school kids and that kind of stuff, you know, doing it. If there was like a restriction on like, do you have to be over 18 in order to be, a, you know, a coach? But if you're mentioning middle schoolers, then obviously they're not going to be over 18. So. Right. So. Um, I, I don't, there is no restriction, but, you know, like I said, if I had middle schoolers coaching, I was always there right? just because, right. you know, they needed the extra help. But, you know, sure. the high school, especially the NHS students, you know, they coached, you know, they would coach at school if they needed to, but sometimes, you know, the parents or the coaches, they coached at home. So, uh, and then the thing is if they are coaching not at school it's a little harder to keep your thumb on what's going on and making yeah. sure the kids are actually attending and uh so you know you just have to keep asking the event coaches is everything okay is everybody showing up do you need anything right so okay. um if they're coaching at school i was always i was always there and i could i yeah. could see what they needed 
so. Perfect. Okay, um, let me go back up here. Um, I don't think I did this one, assigning events. That one was similar to the one for the uh, coaches, but this is a student's form that I'm just sharing with you that when you talk about at your initial meeting and you talk about the different events and then the kids can check off if they're really interested in the event, kind of interested or not interested. So at the initial meeting, I had all of these papers out there for the kids and the parents to sign and fill out. So now, now that you have had your initial meeting, um, now you need to actually put them into events, take the information that's on this page and come up with who's going to do which events. Um, let me get out of here. And I'm going to go to elementary and go to events. And on this page, we have all the events over here on the left hand side. And if you click on any of them, it'll take you right to that page. So let me do anatomy. And all of the pages are set up basically the same. You've got some photographs of kids actually doing anatomy to help the kids see exactly what's going on and what to expect. You have the event rules, which I'll click on here in just a minute, but there's also study guides, things that have been shared over the years for, uh, in this case, anatomy. Um, <clears throat> this was the uh, event coach training from last year that still would be, uh, you know, be helpful. And, um, and just things that, you know, have been shared over the years that your event coach might find helpful. Uh, there's different videos that we have recorded over the years so that the kids and the event coach can see what, what needs to be done, what does the event look like. Um, this particular event uses a zip grade form for the kids to um, uh, record their answers. And a zip grade form is just where, you know, they take a pencil and they fill in the, the, the circle. Uh, in fact, I'll open this up. And surprisingly enough, kids don't know how to fill in a form like that anymore. It used to be kids took standardized tests and they knew exactly how to fill in these forms. Nowadays, kids take most of their standardized tests on the computer. So this is something you, the event coach is going to have to teach them is how to fill out one of these forms and you know how to fill in those little bubbles and fill them in. Uh, you know, fill them in well. Yeah. So um, let me get back to the event. Oops, what happened to anatomy? No, nope, I'll just get back on it. All right, and then there's also uh, test archives, tests over the years that were shared that uh, you might find helpful. Um, I don't know if there's any tests here or not. Oh, there are some district tests from over the years, but now you have to be careful because the tests were not necessarily written by this supervisor that is going to be writing this year's tests. It may not even be matching this year's rules. You know, would it, whichever uh, body systems we're studying this year, those tests may not have the same body systems. Um, and, you know, so you just have to be aware that these are all old tests and they may not necessarily match up with um, 
with this year's rules. There's also all the FAQs that coaches have uh, submitted over the past few years. So the event supervisor or the event, event coaches should you know, check those out because those are, you know, there's some good questions in there. And if they have any questions that they would like to ask that's not there, they can always submit a question down here. So all of the events are set up basically the same way. Let's look at the rules for this particular event. All the rules pages are set up exactly the same way with a description of the event, a short description. How many kids can be on this team? How long this event's going to take? And a little explanation of what the competition will look like and how it will be scored. Now, this particular one also gives a list of the muscular system and the skeletal system that the kids need to be aware of, which for me, this looks overwhelming <laughs> because there's so many things they have to learn, but oh yeah, <laughs> they're going to have like about 20 weeks or so to, to work on it. But yeah. uh, so this is one type of, of an event that where it's more of a, there's a definite number of things you have to study and be aware of. Not all of them are that way. For example, if you look at uh, water bottle rockets, and you know, again, the page is basically set up the same way, but if you look at the events uh, rules for it, you'll see it has all the same things, but Obviously, it's much, much different. There's not a list of things to study. It's more of a, you know, a procedure and, and the things that you have to be aware of when you're building your rocket. So, again, this is more what your event coaches are going to uh, be more interested in. Now, you, as the... Um, as the head coach, there are things that you can do that will help to support your event coaches. For example, um, um, you might have to have a special room. Like for Reflection Relay, you need a dark room. You've got to find a room that's dark if they're going to work at school. You've got to find a room that's darkenable. Um, uh, if you're doing ping pong propulsion, they need a high ceiling. So these are all things that you can help the event coach with to, um, you know, to support them. Um, now, this year you're allowed to have 17 students on the team. And there's also 17 events or 16 events, but then there's also a trial event. That trial event is, uh, I forgot the name of it, it was Code something. Let me look back at the events. Uh, Code Busters is a trial event, which means the kids can try it out. We're looking to see how, you know, how can we run the event because it might be a real event next year. So, um, but since it's a trial event, it doesn't count towards your team score. The kids would get medals for that event if, you know, if they do well in it, but it doesn't add points for your team score. So there's 17 students and there are now 17 events. You don't have to have 17 students if you don't have all 17 students, that's okay. You can come in with fewer students. You don't have to be in all 17 events. Uh, but just be aware that if you're not in an event, your team does get penalized for it. And I didn't understand that. My first year as head coach, we did not do Rock Hound because I was completely overwhelmed. I didn't know the first thing about rocks. And I didn't have rocks, so so we just decided that first year, we're just not gonna do rocks. Well, 
little did I know that we ended up getting penalized for not being in rocks. Had we just at least at least tried, you know, we wouldn't have gotten the penalty for it. So keep that in mind. You don't have to be in all 17 events, but if you're not in the 17th event, in all 17 events, you do have, uh, there is a penalty for it. Something else that you need to do as the head coach. Uh, let me see what page am I supposed to be on here? Oh, I know. I need to go to, I'm going to go to tournaments now. And I'm going to go to the Macomb tournament. And you, you share with your uh, parents any maps that are available. Uh, we're going to talk about the team schedule that you're going to share with your parents here. Um, and, well, let's talk about the, the schedule right now, as a matter of fact. The schedule, let me click on it here to get an enlarged version. You'll see that the schedule, it says it's a draft, but all of these boxes right here are not a draft. These boxes right here are set in stone. These will not change. The reason it says draft on there is because the room number on the side, we don't have the room numbers situated yet. We don't have uh, the information that's at the top that shows you know, where and when the cafeteria is gonna be open, where headquarters is, things like that. We don't have all the answers yet, but the schedule of the events itself is not in draft form. These are the times. Now, these, the schedule here at, means absolutely nothing until you know what your team number is. And let me go back to this page and the team numbers will be listed here. So let's take a look at just all teams. So these are all the teams that have registered and it gives you your team number. So, uh, so we've got we've got 38 teams at this point right now. We have 38 teams that are uh, registered on this team. Can you remind me what the name of your school? Briarwood. We're number 34 right there. Briarwood Elementary in Warren Woods. So okay, Brilliant. so. You are team 34. So let's go back to the schedule. So that means first thing I would do is I would go through on this page and I would circle wherever 34 is. So you can see your team is going to be doing anatomy at 11 o'clock to yeah. 1130. Yeah. And you'll be doing arthropods from 1 o'clock to 130. So I would go through and I would circle all the times. You should have, I believe, no more than two things that you need to do that your team has entered in during each half hour. So we tried to you know, spread it out so you don't have a whole bunch going on in one half hour and nothing all the rest of the day. Right, makes sense. Now, you'll notice that most of the events you are you know, you're, you're scheduled for a specific time. But there are some events like Code Busters and Crash Car and Mystery Architecture and Ping Pong Propulsion and Reflection Relay and Water Bottle Rockets, where the head coach is responsible for scheduling the kids, you know, the, the team. So there'll be a time later on, not now, but I'm thinking probably more like in December or so, you'll get an email from John Ogden, our tournament director, that will say you can sign up for uh, when, you're, when you know when you want your kids to compete in Reflection Relay, you can sign up for this online. So it's it's not always easy because like for reflection relay, you need three kids. So you've got to find a time during this 
time here where all three kids are available. And hopefully you'll find a couple of times when all three kids are available, because if one of the times is filled up, you'll have a second choice of when those three kids are available. Yep. So, and you've got to do that, what, like six times? I think there's six different events. Yep. So I always found that stressful <laughs> to, <laughs> to <laughs> make sure that I had scheduled the kids at the right time. But it's really, really important that you get the scheduling right because we cannot change the schedule. And a lot of times we get something, you know, it's, it's the week before the tournament and the head coach, you know, contacts us and says, oh, I'm so sorry, I messed up when I did the scheduling and I scheduled Billy in two things at the same time. And can we change our, our time for reflection relay or can we change our time? Can we change our team number or something like that? And we have to say no as much as that breaks our heart. Yeah. We have to say no, because if you make one change, that just creates a whole domino effect of things that that affects. So it's really important to get the schedule right now. Or, you know, like I tried to do the schedule like November, December, somewhere around there. That's when I was doing the schedule. So. Let's talk about different ways of dealing with the schedule. Um, oh, by the way, let me go back to this page. Yeah. You'll see that the team numbers are divided up into K5 teams and K6 teams. Yes. So that depends on what what's your highest grade? In the school where I taught, we only went up to fifth grade. So my school was a K-5 team. Teams that go up to, or schools that go up to sixth grade would be K-6 teams. And the reason we have those two divisions is many, many, many years ago, we didn't have the divisions, which meant my K-5 team was competing against sixth graders. Yeah. And we never did very well because it's hard for my kids to compete against sixth grade teams. So uh, I argued this one for many, many years. <laughs> and we eventually solved the problem by dividing the teams into K-5 teams and K-6 teams. That really means nothing to you because the kids, the K-5 teams, the K-6 teams, they all go in to the, you know, to their testing site and they all take it all at the same time. But when the scores go into the computer, the computer will divide it, divide the, the schools up into K-5 schools and K-6 schools. And the only time you see that is during the award ceremony where there will be, they will call K-5 teams, you know, here's your first, second, third place. Here's the K-6 teams for the same event. Gotcha. So really that's the only time where K-5 and K-6 has any effect on you is during the award ceremony. Yeah. But it's just to make it a little bit fairer to the K-5 teams. Okay. So, you're to the point now where you have to fit your kids into the schedule. There's a couple of ways to do that. You've already had the kids fill out that form that says which events they like and don't like. And what some coaches do is they will take the schedule and they'll take all those forms that the kids filled out and they will spend hours and hours and hours figuring out which events to slot the kids into. So Susie liked Reflection Relay, so you know, we'll give her that. And Bobby liked Reflection Relay. And you go through and you, you know, give the kids hopefully everything they wanted. That takes a long time. But 
you know, you, you're doing it by yourself, you can make sure, or, you know, maybe you have somebody helping you, but you can make sure that it's done correctly. And I did that for many, many years. But then I tried something different. I tried having a scheduling meeting where the kids and their parents came to my classroom and I had a hat with everybody's name in it and I picked out a name. Okay, here's Billy. Billy gets his first choice, whichever event he wants to be in and we put him on the schedule. And I go through and I give everybody their first choice. And usually everybody did get their first choice, whatever they wanted. So now all 17 kids have an event and they're on the schedule. I throw all the names back in the hat and now we do it again, round two. And we pull out a name and now it's Samantha. She gets to pick her second event. Well, now she may be able to get what she wants. She might have to take a second choice here, but it's up to her to make that decision of what event she wants as her second choice. This way she can see, you know, I wanted to get in wildlife safari, but it was already closed by the time I got my second choice. So they can see why they didn't get what they wanted. And they have the power then to make a second choice. For me, I found that to be a lot easier. It took about an hour and a half meeting, the kids were watching the schedule, the parents were there watching the schedule to make sure that they weren't double booking themselves. And I found that to be a good way to do it. It was a very stressful hour and a half, but it was done in an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also had, now, I coached in Chippewa Valley, and at that point, we had our our um, we had our district schedule too, so the okay. parents could look at the district schedule and the county schedule and make sure that they weren't double booking themselves in either schedule. Um, that's a little easier now because we've been working hard to match up the district schedule with the county schedule. Yeah. Um, so it would it's it, if there's a conflict between two events that are happening at the same time for you, if it's happening at the county level, it's probably also happening the same way at the district level. So we tried really hard to get the schedules to match up. So there's the same conflict as in both places. Right. So, so anyway, that's the way I did it is by having a scheduling event. Um, both ways work. It's just, you've got to make sure you get it right because uh, the consequences of have, making a mistake at this point is, uh, you know, causes some difficulties. And after my scheduling meeting too, I took that paperwork home and I still spread it out all in front of me and I double checked and I made sure yeah. everybody did it correctly and that there's no double booking of kids. Um, when you're scheduling the kids too, you try as much as you can not to have kids in back-to-back -back events there is like 10 minutes between events, but sometimes your first event might be on one side of the campus and then your second event is on, way on the other side of the campus. Right. It's possible to get from one side of the campus to the other. I've done it. Yeah. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're stressing the kids and the parents out well, by yeah. having, you know, having to go and, and they may not have to go all the way across the campus, but, <clears throat> you know, if you can, try to avoid back-to-back -back events. Um, now, 
when you're placing the students in their events, um, you can allow the kids to be in the same event as they were in last year, if there was a Science Olympiad team last year. Okay. Um, you know, there's some merit to that. The kids learned a lot and they want to try it again. Yeah. And that's fine. Or sometimes coaches say, no, nah, you know, we should let you try something different. So that's totally up to you. It's, it's legal for kids to be in the same event as they were in last year. Um, so, and you will have some new students on the team that, you know, they haven't been in any event yet. Yeah. Um, all right, so you need to pay attention to not only the county schedule, but I'm going to go back here and show you where the district schedules will be. So under elementary, under tournaments. So here's the Chippewa Valley. Uh, anything that pertains to the Chippewa Valley district tournament. And by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, the district tournaments are what we consider practice tournaments. So the kids, right. this usually happens four to six weeks before the county tournament. And it's just a practice. So the kids can see what else do I need to study before the county tournament? So the Chippewa Valley tournament is here. The Lance Cruz information for their tournament will be here. The Utica tournament will be here. Those are our three largest districts in Macomb County. And then the smaller districts that won't have their own district tournament, we invite them all to what's called the South Macomb tournament. And I'm gonna click on that. And that will be on Saturday, March 25th. And there's a video to show what South Macomb Tournament looks like. All of the different announcements, things that you need to know about how do they handle alternate team members and how the awards are going to go and just different information that you need to know. Uh, the maps and the schedules will be posted here. So uh, this will be another important page for you. Yeah. Um, other coaches might be interested in, you know, some, one of the other three pages. But, uh, you know, this will be uh, important information. Going to the practice tournament is just gives the kids so much more practice with their event. But it's also a place where there's fewer teams so they can realize more success. They can, yeah. you know, the more, more kids, a bigger percentage of the kids will be getting, you know, medals and, and trophies sure, because yeah. it's a smaller event. Yeah. Makes total sense. I'm sorry. Say that again. Um, no, I'm sorry. I was just saying it makes uh total sense, you know, you know, just to build up their confidence in that. So, yeah. um, uh, but going back to the uh, schools, and given that my district is very small, we'll most likely be in the South Macomb one, right? Like, um, I don't know. I mean, would I assume, or is there a place to look at to know, like, exactly which one we would be in? Which, which tournament you'll be in? Yes, 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 yeah. for the district one. You will definitely be in South Macomb. Okay. Yeah, that's what I the, thought. I just wanted to verify. Yes, thank you. Right. Yeah, all the Utica teams have theirs. The Chippewa yeah, yeah. team has theirs. Yeah. Lance Cruz yeah. has theirs. And everybody else okay. goes to the uh, uh, South Macomb. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So you've got your scheduling done. Mo uh, the students will be in two events. A few students will be in three events. Um, and let's see, we did all this. All right, so now you're, you also, this is the point where you're finalizing who's going to be coaching the different events. Uh, you know, a lot of times the parents that are going to coach 
would like to coach the event that their kid is in. So, uh, you know, so that's, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of the coaches will be new coaches. They'll be parents, teachers, and so on, like we've talked about. Um, they will be needing supplies. Many of the events, not all events need to have supplies, but, uh, you know, because some of them, you know, like uh, A's for Anatomy, that's basically, you know, they'll get information off of the website for that. So there's not like a real expense for anatomy, but there's other events that do have expenses. So this is where you might need to get some money. Um, in the past, my principal would have, you know, a couple hundred dollars set aside in, in the school budget. The PTO may have uh, helped to you know, supplement that with a couple hundred dollars in the PTO budget. So you might want to check with your principal to see if either of those places have some money for the team. Uh, there are some school districts that or some teams that uh, go to local businesses and ask for donations. And in return, they have, you know, the, uh, the, the business's logo on their t-shirts as advertisement. Um, if an event requires things to be bought, you need to make it clear with your event coach if there's money to buy stuff for that event. And the reason I'm saying this is we had this, um, it was actually a middle school team that had a robotics event and a robotics event tends to be an expensive event. And the coach, the event coach spent a lot of money coaching their kids. And at the end, he turned in all his receipts. Well, there was no money. They didn't plan on spending money on the events. They figured the coaches that was part of their responsibility was to you know, purchase whatever had to be purchased for that event. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a problem there in that he spent a lot of money on the event and yeah. couldn't get reimbursed. So you need to make that clear with your event coaches right off the bat. Do you have money to reimburse them if uh, they have any expenses? If you have limited money, you might decide not to do all the events this year because you simply don't have the money for, you know, to buy the supplies for all the events. And then next year you can add on other, um, other events. Um, <clears throat> some of the supplies that you might be interested in is, I'm gonna go to, Uh, there is a link under elementary and it says kits and supplies. Now, at this moment, it's not ready yet. It will be ready soon, but I am going to, <coughs> I am going to show you what last year's supplies looked like, the, the page where you could order supplies. And you can see here, this, the, what will be up there soon will look very similar to this, but there we have kits that our Science Olympiad Committee has put together for many of the events, not all of the events, they don't all need the kits, but if you have an event supervisor, or I'm sorry, an event coach who's going to coach charged up with a couple of kids, they're probably going to need some equipment. Now you could go out and buy the equipment yourself. There's you know, nothing fancy about this equipment. You'll need a motor and you need a, 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 a testing device and wires and one and a half volt light bulbs and things like that. In this particular case, charged up, some of those are a little bit hard to find. Um, but what we did is we went and we found all of the stuff for you so if you wanted to purchase the box, 
we did all the running around for you. We found all of the motors and the bulbs and the wires and we found everything. And we're just trying to make it easy for you. Uh, you certainly don't have to buy this. We did it for the convenience of the event coach. And it also ends up being a fundraiser for Science Olympiad too. And, you know, some of them are, sim are very simple. You know, like we have the mirrors and that's one of the problems we had is a lot of times the, you know, the parents would say, well, where can I buy a three inch by four inch mirror? And uh, so I learned how to cut glass and I ended up making thousands of these guys and, you know, sanding the edges down and getting them ready for kids to use. So, you know, it wasn't so much for making money for Science Olympiad, it was a convenience for the coaches. So we have, as I said, lots of, oops, that's the wrong page. There we go. We have lots of them. You'll be able to order them on a page that will look very similar to this. So, um, so anyway, as I said, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you. All right. Um, other things that you'll be spending money on. Oh, and by the way, some of these materials, if you're at school was on, had a Science Olympiad team in past years, you may have a lot of that materials in your school. Um, you know, so you might, before you purchase stuff, you may want to check and see if, you know, you know, if some of that material is hidden somewhere in a closet or, or, you know, or whatever. Um, some of the materials <clears throat> you might have in your school too, um, you know, like light bulbs and, you know, I, I think it is a fourth grade that I think teaches, uh, uh, electricity. So, you know, you may have a lot of those materials in your school already. So that would be something else to check out too. Um, some events lend themselves more to the event coach taking the kids to nature centers. And we'll be having workshops at nature centers to, uh, you know, to help the kids, uh, you know, study for their event. Um, other things that you'll be spending your money on, as we said earlier, would be t-shirts. Uh, your, your, at least your kids will probably be wanting to have team t-shirts. And you'll have to decide, are you going to buy team t-shirts for the event coaches too? So that adds to the money. Or do you want them to pay for their own shirts? That's something else you can think about too. Um, I also ended up spending some money on the team meetings. I had two or th three, I think I had three team meetings over the course of the year. Uh, the year. And, uh, you know, I would have, the, well, at least the first meeting, I made sure that I had refreshments there. And then I had parents to sign up to bring refreshments to the other meetings, just to save a little bit of money there. Uh, I also did a celebration at the end when Science Olympiad was all over. I had a celebration with the kids on the Monday after Science Olympiad and you know we had ice cream and pizza and stuff. And so some of the money went for the celebration at the end. Um, all right, so you now have your coaches, you've got all of your materials and the, you know the supplies that you need. Um, so now it's time to start training the kids. Um, what I did is I gave the event rules out to all of the event coaches and I gave the event rules to the kids so that everybody knew exactly what their event was all about. Uh, and by the way, at the very bottom of each event page, there's a year. You want to make sure that it says 
this year's going to say 2023 tournament. So you want to make sure you're not using old schedules um, and you know that the schedule that you're working with is for the 2023 tournament. So I give out the event rules to all the kids and all the coaches. Uh, we looked at the videos that I talked about that explains, you know, what what Science Olympiad's all about. Um, and then there's a meeting that comes up in January, about mid-January. It's an event coach meeting. Uh, it's a workshop. Um, and it's intended just for the event coaches, not for kids. Now, we used to have this as an in-person workshop, but the last couple of years we had to have it as virtual. And we have found that we like the virtual actually better because we could record it and then the coaches could watch it again anytime they needed to. So uh, it will be virtual again this year. It'll be in mid-January. Um, I think it's on a Saturday in mid-January. And this will be the event supervisor talking to the event coaches, explaining the event to the, to the coaches. So your coaches only need to be on this virtual workshop for about 45 minutes. You know, they don't have to be on it all day. Even though it's going to be running all day, they only need to be there for their event but it's very, very helpful for the coaches to know what they need to do in order to get the kids prepared for the Science Olympiad tournament. But it's vital that the you have given the event coach the rules before this event uh, so that they're familiar with the rules before they go to this uh, training workshop. Um, all right, so now you've got your team, you've got the, uh, your coaches, the coaches have now been trained, they know what they need to do, so now it's time to start practicing, and the kids typically practice once a week, sometimes they might sneak in a second to practice during the week, especially as it gets closer to a tournament. They'll uh, try to, you know, sneak in some extra practices in there. Um, you, as the head coach, you've observed, uh, reserved any um, rooms that need to be reserved. Uh, you made the event coaches of, of aware of any workshops that are available for them or for their kids. Um, you also might want to, you yourself, sign up for web alerts, which means you'll be getting alerted every time there's something new on the website. It'd be good for your event coaches to be signed up for the web alerts, too, and you can do that through the, the, uh, the website. Successful teams spend a lot of time, first of all, practicing their event, but then just before the tournament, they practice testing the events. Um, if it's a paper and pencil test, they should be doing a paper and pencil test. Sometimes the, you know, it's like two kids in an event, sometimes they're not allowed to talk to each other. So they should practice not talking to each other during the event, and somehow you need to still be communicating to each other. Um, some kids will be in a station event, which they probably had no experience with doing a station test where you go from one table to the next table to the next table, and they need to practice that. It doesn't do them any good to practice a paper and pencil test if it's going to be a station test. So right. they need to mimic, the, your event coaches need to mimic whatever way that they're going to be tested that's the way that they should be practice testing them. They need to add time pressures. So, uh, you know, if, if it's a station event and you've only got one minute at this station, they need to do that same thing so that kids know what does one minute look like? How much can I get done in one minute? Um, 
some of the events are more of a performance test, like re reflection relay, where they don't know exactly what they're going to have to do until they get there and they see the setup and they're going to have to problem solve right then and there. And the practice that they do ahead of time is learning to talk with each other and get along with each other and uh, you know, brainstorm together how you're going to solve the problem and not argue about it. We've had some teams that came to Reflection Relay and that's all they did was argue and they never, they never actually accomplished the goal. <clears throat> um, okay. So, um, all the important dates that you and the kids and the coaches, they're all listed on the website, the registration deadline, all the training, all the tournaments that they're all listed on the website. Uh, as the head coach, you'll be making sure they are have all the dates, all the schedules, all the maps, all the announcements. That's usually the big thing where uh, people, coaches and parents aren't aware of things. We depend on our head coaches to make sure that they are passing along the announcements to their teams, to their parents, uh, so that they're aware of what's going on and making sure they're aware of any tournament policies. Um, there will be a final registration coming up in, I'm thinking probably about April. You'll be getting an online registration where you, as the head coach, you fill out a certain amount online, and then you forward it on to all of the parents, and then the parents have to fill out a section of it, and then it gets turned in. So, um, so you know, that's an important part, too, is to get that, that final registration turned in. Um, You'll be getting wristbands to put on your uh, your students uh, in order to compete in the event. The kids have to have their wristband on. I always, when I had the wristbands, I would always write their names on each one. And that was my way of taking attendance the morning of the tournament. I had, you know, at that time it was 16 wristbands with the 16 kids names on and as you know I put them on each of the kids wrists and then you know I'd see that you know Bobby is I still have his wristband so I'm missing Bobby it was my way of taking attendance um I always went over I had a meeting just before each of the tournaments the district tournament and the county tournament and one of the things we went over is what materials do you need to bring to your event? And whether it's the kids that are responsible for bringing the materials or if it's the, um, the, the coach, the event coach or the parent, somebody needs to be responsible. You can't be responsible for bringing all 17 event yeah, e nope. equipment. <laughs> so the kids and the coaches need to do that. Um, and I went through this with my kids every year and we made sure we had all our pencils and scissors and everything that we had to have, all the charts that we made, we made sure we had everything. And that was the year we forgot our rubber band catapult. We forgot the whole catapult. Oh, so, no. <laughs> so fortunately we had somebody that could go back to the school, open it up and, and get the catapult yeah. for us. So, you know, some of the more obvious things we missed. So just keep that in mind. You don't have to be responsible for that, but it would be a good thing to go over it and make sure that um, you're ready for whatever. And if you don't know if you have to bring it or not, bring it. You know, right. uh, if you don't know if you have to bring pencils, bring some extra pencils, you know, or, uh, you don't know if you need scissors for this event, bring them anyway. The worst that can happen is, you know, you might not use them and your head coach, your event coach will hold on to them. <coughs> but don't assume that the equipment will be there for you. Bring it with you. 
just in case you need it. Uh, something else that parents and coaches can do to help out is making sure they know where the kids are going. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, the parents will go a couple of days ahead of time and go walk the campus and make sure they know where the buildings are and where the rooms are. Uh, at the least, they need to do it that day before the kids go to that event so that, you know, they're not searching for the room right when they have to be at the room. So planning ahead to know where your events are. So you're making sure that everybody has a schedule. Everybody has an, an, all the maps that they need. Everybody has all the emails and the, all the information that they need. Uh, another event or another thing that you are responsible for as a head coach is you dispute. If there's any disputes, you are the one to resolve it. So if there's uh, an appeal, something went wrong and you're putting in a formal appeal. It's not the event coach that does that. That's the head coach. So if your event coach thinks something went wrong, they need to come to you as the head coach and explain, okay, this went wrong. And if you can't resolve it with the event coach, then it's time to go to arbitration and you go to headquarters. But you as the head coach for, turn in an arbitration form. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, other responsibilities as the head coach is back at your school, advertise the, the team because the team is basically invisible. <laughs> you don't see them during the day when all the kids are there. Uh, many of them are working after school when it, you know everybody else is gone or they're working at home. So you really don't get to see the Science Olympiad team. So it's to your benefit to make sure that the school knows that there is a team there for your school. So get them on the morning announcements, uh, put photographs on the school website. Um, have a bulletin board in the hallway with the team faces on there and what events they're practicing. Getting, getting the school to recognize that you have a Science Olympiad team and, um, and that is an exciting thing to do will help you out next year when you're trying to get a team together yeah. because it'll be more, you know, they've been visible for a year. Um, uh, some coaches, some head coaches will actually have an assembly with maybe one or two grade levels and where the Science Olympiad team can show what they've been practicing, um, you know, show what they know about uh, reflection relay or what their their water bottle rocket looks like. And, and again, just getting the kids' faces out there and getting the Science Olympiad team out there is going to make your job next year that much easier. Um, so celebrating, having a celebration at the end. There are certificates available for you at the um, on the um, head coach page where you can print out certificates for the kids. And there's also certificates for your event coaches. Uh, we have trophies that are uh, that that we'll be handing out, but there are some teams that order their own smaller trophies for each of their team members. That's, you know, something that you can choose to do. Uh, having a celebration at the end, as I talked about earlier. Um, and I think that pretty much goes over anything I can think of. Is there anything that I may have missed? No, honestly, you hit all the different aspects of it. And uh, given my, you know, experience as an event coach, so, you know, a lot of the stuff you were saying, I definitely recall, like, you know, some of this stuff too as well. So, well, you know, many of this stuff too, as you know. So it's, uh, no, no, I don't think you missed anything. I mean, you've answered all the questions I might have had. So thank you. Okay. As time goes on, 
you probably will have questions. Sure. And just keep in mind, <laughs> I'm your person. Okay. So, so if there's anything you need, any questions that you, um, you know, that you have, make sure that you let me know. Sure. So, cool. all right, I'm going to end the video right now. So, and by the way, for the rest of the people that are watching the video, I'm your person too. So if I am the person to help out any new head coaches, you know, to get you going and, you know, get you off to a good start.